Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I'm very, very proud of all of you. You all get extra recess today. Well done. Thank you. Welcome, welcome, welcome to an evening that we have been planning for many months and with great excitement because of the people who we were inviting tonight. We're thrilled you're here. Good evening to everyone. Um, just, just the catering staff would want me to tell you right up front that you should feel free to eat your salad. <laughs> Unless, of course, you want to start on dessert, and that's fine too. So please feel free to dive in, because in about 15, 20 minutes, we'll invite you uh, to, to join the buffet line, okay? We hope you're enjoying your evening so far. Uh, we're going to begin the agenda for this evening, but please feel free to enjoy your food and your drinks. Uh, the bar will remain open all the way through dinner, and uh, so please feel free. And I'm delighted tonight, I'm really delighted tonight to be with you to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the Fulbright program. When Senator Fulbright created this program in 1946, he had a vision for a peaceful world built on mutual understanding and collaboration. Each person in this room is a testament to that vision. And so today, we celebrate you. My name is Roger Brindley. I'm the Vice Provost for Penn State Global, and I'll be your host tonight. So I'll be popping on and off stage as we go through the evening to introduce speakers. You will see monitors around the room displaying a slideshow featuring pictures that you provided from your Fulbright experiences. So as you eat your dinner tonight, keep a half an eye on the screen, and, and you'll see this extraordinary graphic testimony to all that you've accomplished as Fulbrighters. We do hope that you, some of you had a chance to mingle with fellow Fulbrighters at our reception and that to meet our very, very special guests this evening. So I'd like to welcome here this evening Dr. Alan Goodman, CEO of the Institute of International Education. Welcome, Alan. And I would like to uh, give a warm welcome to Deputy Assistant Secretary for Cultural Programs, Ethan Rosenswig, from the Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs in the State Department. And Ethan surprised us at the 11th hour by whistling up our very own Penn State alum, his colleague, Ashak Bhatt, who serves as the ECA's Congressional Advisor. Welcome back, oh, welcome home, Ashak. We're delighted to be joined by Executive Vice President and Provost Nicholas Jones, who is joined by his spouse, Judy Graham, an officer for the National Philanthropic Partnerships at Geisinger Health Foundation. Welcome, Nick and Judy. And please welcome President Eric Barron, who's joined this evening by his wife, Molly. Molly, a lifelong educator, and an advocate of students and learners of all ages, right? So thank you so much, thank you. Tonight we're going to hear first from President Barron and Dr. Goodman before dinner. So eat that salad. After dinner, we will hear from Deputy Assistant Secretary Rosenzweig and then move into our recognition ceremony. After that ceremony, the night will conclude with some comments from Nick Jones. So to begin, I'll introduce our first speaker. I do so reflecting that this may be the last time I have the pleasure of introducing him, or at least the last time in his current role. Our first speaker is President Eric Barron, who began his tenure as the 18th president of the Pennsylvania State University on May 12th, 2014. Previously, Dr. Barron served as president of Florida State. He has more than 40 years of leadership experience in academic administration, education, research, and public service, as well as a track record as a talented manager of fiscal policy within large and complex institutions. 
That's what I was told to say, right? Did I got that right? <laughs> President Barron is chairman of the Board of Trustees for the University's Research Association and also serves on the Board of Directors for Kish Bangkok Incorporated. He previously served on the Board of Trustees for the University Corporation of, for Atmospheric Research and also as a member of the Knight Commission and the College Football Playoff Board of Managers. So you can talk to him afterwards about that piece. Barron spent the first 20 years of his career at Penn State, previously serving as Dean of the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences from 2002 through 2006, and as a founding director of the Earth System Science Center, one of the first major initiatives focused on the total study of Earth as a system. In 1999, he was named Distinguished Professor of Geosciences at Penn State. An accomplished scientist with a long background in atmospheric research, Barron was the director of the National Center for, Oce for Atmospheric Research and dean of the Jackson School of Geosciences at the University of Texas at Austin. <gasps> Over the decades, Barron has lent his significant expertise in the areas of atmospheric science and geosciences to many committees and federal agencies, including nearly 20 years of service as the chair of multiple National Research Council committees and boards. He earned his BS in geology at Florida State University and his MS and his PhD in oceanography at the University of Miami. It's important to say all of that because we just think of President Barron for his extraordinary leadership as a president, but he is a remarkable scholar and academician and researcher. Please join me in welcoming President Barron. Well, thank you, Roger. Good evening to everybody. You know, my wonderful wife taught five grades in a single classroom when I met her. And I figured this is the one person in the world where I'm, she can handle me just fine. And so all those kids in one, so truly a lifelong educator. Um, and quite frankly, teaching at all levels is a very noble profession. So, well, it's a absolute thrill to have so many of Penn State's Fulbright scholars here all together in one group. I know you know you're a select group with something like 1,200 scholars receiving awards each year. The competition for these awards is truly fierce. You brought honor to this institution through your outstanding work, and that work has led to your selection as Fulbright Scholars. So thank you. Thank you for all that you do, and welcome to all of you that have served as Fulbright Scholars. I would also like to add a special welcome to our distinguished guests, Alan Goodman, CEO of the Institute of International Education, and Ethan Rosenzweig from the U.S. Department of State. It's truly an honor to have you join us here uh, today, and we're very grateful for the fact that you're going to speak later in the program, so, so thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm very pleased to be celebrating the 75th anniversary of the Fulbright Program which I believe is one of the most significant pieces of federal legislation related to higher education. Like the Land-Grant College Act of 1862 and the Morrell Act of 1890, the Fulbright Program has helped shape the mission of higher education by promoting cross-cultural collaboration for mutually constructive and beneficial purposes. The only thing I wonder is, 75 years is a long time. We should have at least two more seminal higher education projects to add to the Morrell Act and to the Fulbright Act, it seems to me. It's, it's time. Well, today, the idea that we all live in a global society is widely accepted. But in 1964, that wasn't the case. And Senator Fulbright championed the vision for a global society and created an avenue for ambitious, talented, brilliant scholars to collaborate and to expand their ideas. Their experiences, the experiences of our 
Fulbright scholars that they've had during these, their time abroad. It clearly has enriched teaching and research and service activities that are at the very center of what is Penn State's mission as a land grant. What's more, I often talk about just how critical it is for college students to participate in worthwhile activities outside of the classroom. We know from an awful lot of data that those students are healthier and they're happier and they have better grade points, they've got a better peer group, they have a better resume, and they have more opportunities that are added to the fact that they have a Penn State degree. I think the exact same thing is true for faculty members, as someone who spent most of his life as a faculty member. Now, I don't know whether you've ever done this, but if you Google faculty burnout, in a very short amount of time, you'll get 11.6 million hits. Part of that great resignation that people talk about can be attributed to the pandemic, but we're also acutely aware of the challenge required to consistently produce high-quality teaching, high-quality research, and to do the service that all of us value to our society and to our communities. The Fulbright Scholarship Program is also an opportunity to recharge and refresh. And I know that the times that I've had to escape my own set of tasks and things that have kept me busy, and just to have that opportunity to work with colleagues in another place, in my case in, in Cambridge in the UK, were some of the finest moments of scholarship, and I always came back refreshed and recharged. Well, I'm incredibly proud of the high level of involvement of Penn State in the Fulbright, uh, both for our in Fulbright Scholarship for both our students and our faculty. The first Penn State Fulbright scholars were Haskell Curry, Holden Ferber, and John Alden in 1950. Since then, the number of scholars has grown significantly, with roughly eight to 10 Penn State faculty members receiving Fulbright programs awards each year. It gives me great pleasure to sit there and see the list and say, once again, Penn State is near the top in terms of the number of Fulbright honorees. Well, we recognize the benefits for our institution, higher education, and the greater good, and we recognize the value this is for your own scholarship and opportunities. So again, it's my pleasure to be here with you this evening, and on behalf of Penn State, thank you for joining us to celebrate Fulbright's 75th anniversary, and thank you for your commitment to this institution and to making a better planet. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Barron. Your commitment to Penn State as a globally engaged university has prepared our academic and research communities for the future, and we're profoundly grateful. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to welcome our first keynote speaker this evening, Dr. Alan Goodman. Dr. Alan E. Goodman is Chief Executive Officer of the Institute for International Education, which marked its centennial in 2019. IIE promotes the exchange of scholars and students, rescues scholars, particularly pertinent today, students and artists from persecution, displacement, and crises conducts research on international academic mobility, and administers the Fulbright program. Dr. Goodman is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and serves on the selection committees for the Rhodes and Schwarzman Scholars and the Yidan Prize. He also serves on the Council for Higher Education Accreditation International Quality Group Advisory Council and the Board of Trustees of the Education Above All Foundation. Dr. Goodman has a PhD in, gov in government from Harvard, an M 
BA from the John F. Kennedy School of Government and a BS from Northwestern University and is a recipient of honorary degrees from Canadian, European, Japanese, UK, and US universities. See how we did that Brexit bit there, Alan? Did you see that? <laughs> he has been recognized for his work in promoting educational exchange and scholar rescue from the governments of France, Germany, and Norway. He received the inaugural Gilbert Medal from the Universitas 21 organization. Before joining IIE, Dr. Goodman was Executive Dean of the School of Foreign Service and Professor at Georgetown University. His books on international relations are published by Princeton, Harvard, and Yale University Presses, and he has served at the Department of State and in the Central Intelligence Agency. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Goodman to the stage. I'm just so sorry that my kids aren't here because they'd never believe I had a red carpet <laughs> or, or an introduction like that. So thank you so, so very much. Uh, because we're in an academic setting, I think it's important to lead with a big question. For me, the big question is why is everybody that got educated in either New Zealand or Florida moving to Penn State? But it is the great thing about Penn State that it attracts the world and brings the world here and shares the world uh, of America with, with, with everyone. Uh, it's an honor for my colleagues and I to work with Ethan, Deputy Secretary. It's an honor to share the podium with you. Uh, he has a very important statement for you in just a few minutes after dinner. Uh, and. and <clears throat> Fulbright is the most important thing any of us do in a single, single day. The last time I was here, it was before Roger, uh, and I was uh, to speak at a, uh, what I thought was a small lunch of the international office, your, your legendary international office at Penn State. But the instructions were very clear. Go to that building, and there's a ballroom A and a ballroom B. Uh, go to ballroom B. And I'm beginning to look at the size of thinking how small. I mean, because ballroom A was the monthly alumni football lunch. <laughs> and I peeked in, and it was absolutely huge. Uh, and, and I'm saying, you know, if I could have two tables, that would just be great. Ballroom B was twice the size. And it was a trifecta. It was, it was huge. It had your Fulbrights. Uh, it, it had your administration. And it had your predecessor. Uh, they weren't in the football lunch. And it struck me that Penn State's got it right. There's a reason you're a top producing school. There's a reason that Penn State has a history with Fulbright that goes back to 1950. It's because your top leadership think this is the future of Penn State and the way Penn State can invest in making the world a less dangerous place. Uh, and guess what? Uh, there is no ballroom A. Football season is over and we have the president, the provost, vice provost, so I, I feel Penn State really gets internationalization right. Now there is also something you should know about Roger. Uh, the last time we were together was at an event in that state south of Pennsylvania. Uh, <clears throat> and Roger and his president had the idea that Maybe we should recognize and bring together all of the Fulbright faculty uh, at the University of South Florida, that the president should honor the Fulbright alumni, uh, students, and scholars, and, and make sure that the campus knew they had approximately 100 on campus at any given time. Uh, it was, was like ballroom B. It was filled. It was a breakfast. 
The president was there, the former president, whose daughter was a member of Congress. And the kind of recognition that Roger arranged that day for Fulbright will be like you're doing tonight. I've never forgotten it because every other place I speak, I say, you should do what Roger does. Uh, he, he will do wonders for you, but, but what was so striking after the Roger event in Florida was that we had a surge of applications to the Fulbright program, students and especially scholars, and it has been sustained. And I, I think we're gonna have a surge uh, from Penn State, and I'm here to tell you, and Ethan as well, that this is a surge we're ready, willing, and able to welcome. And that's what Penn State represents to our world, and it's just a pleasure and a privilege to recognize Roger and his fabulous office and their work, because Fulbright is everybody's future, and you play a big part in it. So thank you so much for having me, and President, Provost, Thank you very much for your support. Uh, we need it every day. Thank you. Well, Alan, I, I think we can go home now. <laughs> we got that on video somewhere, right? We got it? OK. I'll be quiet and behave myself. Thank you, Alan, for your kind words. And we're really, really, really pleased you're here tonight because we know that, that significant programs like the Fulbright are only successful if there's the quiet hand behind them making sure that all the resources are there. So thank you for all you do. Okay, I can hear from the chinking that most of the salad has been eaten, so everybody's done very well there. We now invite everyone to enjoy their dinner, but um, Penn State staffer, uh, uh, Penn State Stater staff, try saying that three times fast, Penn State, st state Penn Stater staff, there we are, will ask each table to join the buffet line in order. So please wait until your table is cold, and then we'll, we'll go ahead and eat. In about 30 minutes, we'll have a chance to, after we've had a chance to enjoy our main course, we'll move on to the next phase of the evening together. And during your main course, we will show more of those slides that you sent in. So do enjoy those, and bon appétit. The next portion of our evening is really why we're here all tonight. Uh, we're here, we are all here tonight. It is the Fulbright Ceremony to re recognize and applaud you for your achievement as Fulbright scholars, specialists, and in some cases, students. Our planning for a 75th anniversary began last fall. As we reflected on this momentous milestone for the Fulbright program, and on Penn State's role as a frequent top producer of Fulbright scholars, we decided it was time to survey our entire Penn State family. We established that 209 Fulbrighters call this university home. And despite the fact that it's a Friday evening on a rather rainy and cold early April day, and despite the fact that some of you have had to drive two and a half, three, three and a half hours, almost half of those 209 are with us tonight. I would like to reassure you, so when you get back to your department, to your office, and they say, oh no, I should have been there, that they will receive their medallion from us as well. Many of you sought guidance from your colleagues who are members of a discipline-based Fulbright panel here at Penn State while you were preparing your applications. This means I did something wrong. We're going to do we're going to do the Deputy Assistant Secretary first. <laughs> Look, here's my Deputy Assistant Secretary page. Well, enjoy that dinner. <laughs> what they don't know won't hurt them. 
We had so much fun. I'm not going to repeat that other page when I get to it, incidentally. We had so much fun capturing the images you sent on our accompanying slides. I hope you got a chance to enjoy those as you're reading. And we really appreciated the range of locations and contexts that you helped us to document. As we move forward to our next speaker, please feel free to keep enjoying your wonderful food. Our second keynote speaker for the evening is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Cultural Programs, Ethan Rosenswig, from the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the State Department. The ECA is mandated to build friendly and peaceful relations between the people of the United States and other countries through academic, cultural, sports, and professional exchanges. The ECA's mission is to increase our mutual understanding. Deputy Assistant Secretary Rosenzweig joined the ECA from Atlanta, Georgia, where he worked at Emory University's School of Law as Associate Dean overseeing enrollment management and student services, including international recruiting and engagement activities. A graduate of Emory Law, Ethan clerked for the Honorable G. Ernest Tidwell of the U.S. District Court of Northern Georgia and then practiced law in Charleston, South Carolina. Before Emory, he completed a Presidential Management Fellowship at the U.S. Department of Education and has received an undergraduate and master's degree in public policy from American University, which is my daughter's alma mater. Please join me in welcoming Deputy Assistant Secretary Rosenzweig to the stage. Good evening, everybody. Look, I see those desserts in front of you. I also know that some people have apple and some people don't. So it's okay to, to trade. This isn't like elementary school. I can wait to see it. But please feel free to um, enjoy your dessert. I appreciate you having me here. Roger, what, what a wonderful, where did you go? What a wonderful evening. And, and I know, and I know you're going to acknowledge them, but what your staff, I know how much work goes into this. And I know the work that Mel and Colleen and others here have done is extraordinary. And I know all of us here are just so proud to be here and, and to have this just beautiful setting and to make sure all the details are, are perfect so that we can have this community building event. So thank you, and it matters, and you know that. I'm so proud to be here at Penn State tonight celebrating with you, joining my colleague, President Barron, all of your leadership. This is because of you. And I know that's humbling, and you're a humble man, but we all know that it takes leadership from the top to say this matters, because that's a signal. And growing up in the university system, being in the higher education um, uh, career path, we look for those signals. And I appreciate you and your wife Molly ensuring that all of us know that what we do has such an impact and we could keep doing this as well. Provost Jones, I don't know how you do it. <laughs> Managing the faculty, the curriculum, the academics, all of the parts of the university to make it the heartbeat. And I hope seeing this tonight um, touches you in a way to know that all of our faculty colleagues here come every day uh, to make sure that we're serving a better place and that's under your leadership, so thank you as well. Penn, uh, Penn State's program liaison, uh, Sylvester Osagi, you're in the back, and it was uh, great to see you. I think we should all give him a hand because we know how much he has in this as well. And meeting your wife as well, it's just been an honor. There you go, thank you, sir, you should stand up. And then my colleague, Dr. Alan Goodman, who's welcomed me to DC. I was just appointed, I keep saying six months, someone whispered to me it's been eight months, but I'm a lawyer, we're not good with math. Um, so, um, welcomed me, inspired me, um, let me know that while my appointment's a, a short part of time, the baton I've been given is very powerful, and your leadership as well, sir, is why we're here, and I appreciate that and all you're doing for us and for Fulbright and for me personally. It is, we're all in higher ed, we're in education, and the last two and a half years have been the most difficult, people say one of the most difficult times, like I don't know when else it would be so much difficult. Um, 
and whether we're formally working with students in a university setting, uh, in the classroom. We come every day to give our students and our colleagues a little more push forward. I remember two years ago, I was a senior administrator at Emory, and one day we were told, we've got to box up our students' belongings and get it back to them. Um, that's how chaotic it was. So I'm like, great, whatever we need to do. And someone said, no, no, not you. And I'm like, please, you've never seen my house. I can box things up with everybody else. And I give that example because us at higher education administration, whatever level we're at, whether we're entry level with the students, seeing them every day, working with them through their issues and their successes, at the faculty level, Sylvester and I were talking, motivating, inspiring, steering. The international level, abroad, being the one American that a whole community is exposed to. It's been difficult, and we come back every day. And I think that holding this and pausing for this celebration till we could get back together means a lot, Roger, because presence matters. And we're going to keep going even when we can't be physically present, but I hope that we keep pushing towards ensuring that our students and our scholars can travel again, can have that physical presence and make those commitments. And that's because of everybody here, and I recognize that. And every day when I go to work, trust me, I bring the experiences of the career that led to me to this moment to everything that I'm doing. Fulbright today is incredible. Roger told us the history of Fulbright from 1946. What it's doing now in over 160 countries, providing students, scholars, teachers, scientists, researchers, artists, other professionals the opportunity to study, teach, conduct research, exchange ideas, and work towards solving the most complex challenges in the world. It's just extraordinary that this vision, 75 years ago, has been institutionalized and we're here today to look about what direction we're going. Over 400,000 people from all backgrounds have participated in the Fulbright program. And they've returned home with an expanded world view, a deep appreciation for their host country, and a new network. They've inspired all of us, and you've inspired a whole group of people to be the best they can be. They've included Fulbrighters fighting COVID, award-winning journalists like the 2021 Pulitzer Prize winner, Mega Rajagopalan, who covered the PRC government's mass detention of Muslim Uyghurs. They include the 2021 Nobel Pro Peace Prize laureate, Maria Ressa, who was in DC last week, who was celebrated for her impact in the Philippines for her efforts to safeguard freedom of expression, which is a precondition for democracy and lasting peace. And working at a university, when we champion freedom of expression, we have to champion the good and the times where we really have to dig deep and say, this is why we're here. And I know, President, there are times when we have to embrace that freedom of expression, even when it causes heartache. But that's what we do, and that's what we teach around the world, that it's okay to have disagreement. Our own Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, is a great supporter of the program. He said, the members of the Fulbright community are change makers. They care deeply about the problems facing the world today, and through Fulbright, they help strengthen our world from classrooms, villages, universities, and cities across the globe. Fulbright, to me, is making those lifelong bonds and expanding our community a little more from where we found them. I was talking to one of our Fulbrighters from Russia working on protein research. There you go. And, and I was just sitting there thinking, the impact of that group of people you were working with, that goes on. Even in the times today, those positive relationships, those academic and scientific connections, that's what's going to ensure that we solve these global crises that we're facing today. My first international, really, experience, I call it, was not going abroad, actually. 
I was not as fortunate to go, and I'll talk about that in a moment. It was at law school, and I had hair then, and first day of school, I went in, and there was a Chinese national assigned in our class, an exchange student, or three-year exchange student, Ping Ping Lu. And the way they break out law school, for those of you not fortunate enough to have gone to Dickinson or other schools as, as I had, they're small little groups, then you get into bigger classes. And our small group, about 20 people, I sat next to their professor comes in and starts just doing what you see on TV, just railing on us. And I turned to Ping Ping and I go, what did we get signed up for? <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, I think that's what they call sarcasm. Because <laughs> this was her first month in the, in the States. And I'm like, exactly right, <laughs> exactly right. And we're going to be friends, I told her. <laughs> so for three years, Ping Ping was in my study group. We learned a lot. I wasn't exposed to the PRC at that time. And we went on our way graduated, met her family, so fortunate they were able to come and attend. And our large group of friends had a celebration, and she went on her way and studied. But it's those connections that I was just talking that we made. 20 years later, I'm at a different level at my university career, and I'm in China representing the university. And I said, you know, I should, how hard could it be to find somebody, right? It's China, how hard? <laughs> so <laughs> I found Ping Ping, who was vice president of a small little company called Yum Yum Brands China, which if you don't know is Pepsi, KFC, Pizza Hut. She had grown into this position and somehow I was able to connect to her and we had arranged to meet each other. And I went and saw her. It was like no time had passed. I remember her saying that she never thought she would be in this career, but for the experiences she had with her group of friends, understanding relationships. She said she wasn't a business person, but she realized that's how business is done worldwide. So we're walking away. I'm kind of emotional. I'm like, gosh, like, the world is smaller than we think. She said, I need to show you this picture. I'm like, oh, she goes, oh, it's my son. I'm like, oh, great. And she goes, I named him Ethan. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. I'm like, so I'm getting a little sentimental. And she goes, well, not because of you personally. I just like that name. I never heard it before. And I'm like, perfect, perfect lawyer. Always says it the best. I tell you that story because those are the connections that I know is what drives us as Fulbrighters. It's why so many of you have done a second and even a third Fulbright to build those relationships, because one by one, we're making the world sm smaller. And here at Penn State, we've seen so many alumni who have been champions of Fulbright. Dr. Cushman, are you here? Someone told me, there you are. I'm sorry I didn't get to say hello yet. Dr. Cushman was a US scholar, is well, always a US scholar, right, to the France. She's Chancellor of Penn State Beaver now. I'm so proud that you're here with us tonight. Dr. Ralph Ford was a US scholar to Czech Republic and is Chancellor of Penn State Erie. The accomplishments of what you see in our senior leadership doesn't just represent Penn State. It represents Fulbrighters across the world. And here at Penn State, you're helping us at State tackle all of the most urgent issues facing the world. You're with us every step of the way. When we're fighting climate change, you're there with us. Erica Smithwick, there you are. Erica's in the back. 2016 Fulbrighter to study carbon storage in South Africa. This helps us in our bigger goals to leave the world a little better for our children and our future because of that work. As we work to promote DEIA at state and our government, we know Penn State's with us with access and inclusion. Your Fulbright alumni ambassador, Aria Mia Lombardi, is pursuing her PhD. She's not here tonight, but you need to meet her. She did a Fulbright during the pandemic in the UK studying COVID precautions for those with disabilities. She is blind. And in addition to her research, she's also an actress and will soon be on Netflix in its adaptation of All the Light We Cannot See. That's Penn State. When we're promoting cultural understanding, Penn State's with us. Dr. Catherine Wanner, Catherine, are you here? Where's Catherine? No. 
Oh, I'm sorry, you see, they blocked me. There you are. Professor of History, Anthropology, Religious Studies, and a Fulbrighter in Ukraine. I know you've written several books on Ukrainian history, identity, and religion. And I know that Pennsylvania is home to over 122,000 Ukrainians, the second most of any U.S. state from what my limited research has taught me. It's such a blessing to have a Ukraine expert here on campus at this time to share your wisdom with the students, the faculty, and community. That's what Fulbright's about. I'm so, so proud you're representing the university here. And I'm so proud that this university I learned is trying to help even more Ukrainians with scholarships. And President, I know you're leading that charge to ensure that the next year that Ukrainians that need to study here can, and we appreciate the support you're putting through to that. As we promote now more than ever the free exchange of information and fight back against disinformation, if you had told me a year ago I'd be promoting democracy, I would have been like, what are you talking about? But that's what we need to do, and Fulbright's there, and Penn State's there with us. Last year, through the Fulbright Specialist Program, Professor Prasinchi Mitra, are you here, Professor? I don't think you're here. She spent two weeks at a university in Colombia introducing experts in the university's communication and language department to technologies that can be used to automatically detect online disinformation, misinformation. That's what Fulbright is here for. So as we celebrate the past 75 years and the contributions of those that I just mentioned, let's look forward to the next 75. Our Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, Lee Satterfield, leads our global efforts to engage through academics, cultural, professional, and youth exchanges. She and the Poland and Biden administration are focused on ensuring that diversity, equity, and inclusion are at the heart of everything that we're doing. And I'm proud that Penn State so much prioritizes accessibility. You've launched a pilot program to reduce tuition for Fulbright foreign students for the next academic year. That matters. That brings down the barriers. I was not fortunate, as I told you, to study abroad. Just wasn't in the financial picture at that time. I was a Pell Grant recipient, like so many of us here were, and really relied on that program. But I did get to go abroad. I was going to do that. And I remember going, and I, I kind of laugh now looking back on it. I had my two suitcases. I went for one week to Asia before the internet, so I had to go to a travel agent to find the cheapest ticket. And I had my two bags. I had my clothes, and I had my ramen noodle bag. And the reason I did, and I laughed that I did this, because I wanted to save money to enjoy dinner experiences when I was there. By making it easier to open up international experiences to students, it can explore the world for them. And I appreciate what Penn State's doing to lower those barriers. I was looking at the stats on Penn State's history with Fulbright. It's incredible. The University Park campus has sent over 850 U.S. Fulbrighters abroad in the history of the program. It's why Penn State has been recognized as a Fulbright top producer for the last 13 years. Sylvester told me he's got the letter from the secretary. I hope he shares it with everybody here. Close to 550 Fulbright foreign students have been hosted on this campus, including 14 this year. Penn State has hosted over 450 Humphrey Fellows, which is a Fulbright activity from 130 countries in the history of the program. It's incredible. So let me just wrap it up by thanking you. By leaving with a challenge to help us, help this administration realize more opportunities for students to go abroad even beyond Fulbright. Help us encourage more faculty to go abroad because we know the power that their research and their scholarly pursuits impact. And we also know the power they have in the classroom over our students to encourage them to go abroad as well. Help us sow the seeds of collaboration among students and researchers, teachers and faculties in a way that ensures that global international education is accessible to everyone. Let's not wait another 75 years. 
Let's do this more often. It doesn't have to be this formal, though I like it. And you have the building here for it. And so many beautiful facilities here for it. I appreciate you joining me here and allowing me to have, to have the honor of coming and being part of this historic night that I'm going to remember for a long time. For my colleague Akash Bhatt, who, as Roger said, I dragged him here when I found out we have Penn State in our building, and he bleeds, he bleeds it. That's all he talks about in the office. So I'm glad you're here from class of 2001, a major in international politics and really representing this community so well at the department directly in all that we do. I'm looking forward to getting to know you all a little more, to collaborating over the next few years, and ensuring that we shape the world in our own special way. Thank you so much, and congratulations, everybody. Thank you so much, Deputy Assistant Secretary. We, we really appreciate your presence here tonight. <clears throat> so where was I? Oh, yes. Many of you, I never live that one down, trust me. Adrian, it's because you bought that second glass of wine, I blame you. Many of you brought guidance from your, sought guidance from your colleagues who are members of the discipline-based Fulbright panels. While you were preparing your applications, you needed their guidance, you needed their wisdom, their experience, and their capacity to be critical mentors. They're not all here tonight, but some of them are. So I'd like to recognize the following individuals. If you're here, please stand and remain standing so that when I've completed the list, we can recognize your commitment. And what I'd ask the rest of us to do is just to hold our applause until I've called each of these names. And again, they, they couldn't all be here tonight, but all of these names should be read. So Sylvester Osagi, if you'd stand, Sylvester. David Moran, Stephen Rubin, Chris Massarella, Randall Newnham. Sandra Harbert Pratulininas, Anil Kulkani, Russell Frank, Denise Potoski, Anthony Olorusi Runisolo, excuse me, Anthony, John Ellis, Rick Bates, Anne Killebrew, Nicole Webster, Timothy Bralauer, Peter Scholl. Julio Urbane, Karen Kiefer Boyd, Anne Tarantino, Neil Korostov, David Post, Dana Mitra, and Beth Farmer. Thank you so much, mentors. Now I'm going to ask our mentors to stay standing. And I'm going to ask you if you have received a Fulbright from this institution and have your medallion with you, to go ahead and stand with them, please. So that's most people in the room. Go ahead and stand. If you're a Fulbrighter and you got your medallion, go ahead and stand. Now, some of you couldn't wait to get that medallion on, and that was fantastic. But if you haven't already pinned yourself with our magnetic pin, would you please take your special medallion that we've commissioned to mark the occasion of the Fulbright Program's 75th anniversary, and would you please affix it to your collar or your clothing? There we go, we're working on that. While you're doing that, we hope that you'll treasure the medallion as a token of Penn State's pride in your achievements. And we hope to do future Fulbright events. Ethan, we will certainly let you know. 
It will not be 75 years. And we hope that when you come back, you will wear your medallions. So now, if we have all affixed our medallions, let's give ourselves a big round of applause. Thank you. Now, please take a seat. Thank you for doing that with me. And I'll briefly explain how we will invite each of you to stage to be recognized and photographed with our distinguished leadership and guests. You're seated at a table according to your Fulbright geographic region. And we'll invite you up to the stage by that Fulbright region. Alexandra Pasico and Ryan Geiger, who are standing in the back, will you wave Alexandra and Ryan? Thank you so much, colleagues. We'll prompt your table one by one as we go through the Fulbright regions to the stage where you will be met at the end of the red carpet by Haley Dietz. Haley, will you wave? All right, so that's the plan, okay? As I call your name, along with your Fulbright year, and Fulbright Country. Please cross the stage to be recognized by our guests, President Barron, Provost Jones, President Goodman, and Deputy Assistant Secretary Rosenzweig. Our photographer will then capture the moment before you exit stage right. That way we won't sort of have a bottleneck here, right? And you'll head down the stairs to my right where Aisha will be here to welcome you back to the floor. Thank you, Aisha. You got this down right, this is so good. Please also note that we'll be taking a group photograph at the end of the evening, so don't leave without being part of that photograph. That'll be absolutely great. So at this point, I'd like to invite President Barron, Provost Jones, President Goodman, and DAS Rosenswick to join me on the stage. For each geographic region, I will share a story that has come from a Fulbrighter's journal. These are stories that share experiences and reflections that you, as Fulbrighters, may especially appreciate. So, Alexandra and, uh, and Ryan are pulling their first table. Thank you so much. Our first region is the Western Hemisphere. As our colleagues begin to move to the stage, I'll share our first Fulbright story. Fulbright is about flexibility. This is a quote. I was excited when I began my Fulbright. I had my paperwork in order and I had my plan fixed in my mind. However, soon after I arrived, I realized my host community was not interested in my project. I was going to have to change my plan, but to what? So I explored. And what I found was there were women being trained in a field that was not traditionally a woman's role. And my research was transformed and became a way to provide insight into the experiences of modernity for young women in my host country. The Western Hemisphere shows the lasting power of the Fulbright program in bringing remarkable scholars from around the world to join us in the United States. Jose Pinto Duarte has received two Fulbright awards for scholarship in the United States, both in 1991. We're going to put you in the middle. There we go. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, terrific. Thank you. Tobias Brinkman, 
completed his Fulbright Award in 1991 in the United States. Welcome, Tobias. Christopher Kiva completed his Fulbright in 1994 in the United States. Thank you, Christopher. David R. Smith completed his Fulbright Award in 1995 in Canada. Martin Nieto Perez completed his Fulbright in 1998 in the United States. Thank you, Martin. Thank you so much. Michelle Meckel completed a Fulbright Award in 2004 in Canada. Lydia Ivoritska, I hope I got that right, Lydia, Lydia Yavoritska, our colleague from Ukraine, completed her Fulbright in 2008 in the United States. Ciela Maximova has received three Fulbright Awards for work in Colombia in 2009, 2019, and 2020. Jay Reagan completed a Fulbright Award in 2009 in Chile. Yufeng She completed his Fulbright Award in 2010 in Canada. Flor Acevedo completed her Fulbright Award during the 2010 to 2013 period in the United States here at Penn State. Pauline Millwood completed her Fulbright in 2011 in the United States. Rosalind Constantino 
completed her Fulbright in 2011 in Guatemala. Carter Hunt completed his Fulbright in 2019 in Ecuador. Rachel Brennan completed two Fulbright Awards in Colombia in 2018 and 2019. Pat Dolan, our special guest from the National University of Ireland, Galway, is presently visiting Penn State on a Fulbright scholarship, and we're delighted to welcome him tonight, as well as his wife, Mary. Daniela Gachago has joined us from Cape Town as a Fulbright Scholar in the Schreier Institute for Teaching Excellence. <laughs> and finally, for the Western Hemisphere, I would be remiss if I did not mention a Fulbright scholar who happens to be standing on the stage. Provost Nicholas P. Jones completed his Fulbright in the United States in 1980. Provost Jones, would you like your picture taken? <laughs> The second region we'll recognize this evening is Sub-Saharan Africa. Here's a brief story from that region that we hope may resonate with some of you. Fulbright is about crossing bridges, sometimes literally. Quote, in the jungle we encountered a series of hand-built bridges, perhaps 130 feet above the surface and 1,000 feet long in total. Hesitant to cross at first, we realized there was no other way. A few brave souls were the first to try and thereby encouraged the others who stepped onto the bridge en masse. The sudden burden caused the bridge to sway, making many of us think we were certain to be thrown to our doom. Needless to say, the bridge held. For Sub-Saharan Africa, Sylvester Sagi completed his Fulbright in 2003 in Ghana. Iyun Asagi completed her Fulbright in 2003 in Ghana. <laughs> Will you humor us? Let's get a family picture. Oh, family picture. Will you humor yourself first? This is not our only family picture tonight. I want to know what happened in Ghana in 2003. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Anthony Olorinisola completed his Fulbright during 2005 2006 in Nigeria. Erica Smithick completed her Fulbright in South Africa during 2015-2016. Kofi Adu completed his Fulbright during 2018-2019 in Ghana. Now we move on to the Fulbright region for South Asia, Central Asia, the Middle East and North Africa. Our third region combines a significant area, and many of you may appreciate the thought behind this story. Fulbright is about being comfortable with uncertainty. I provided the taxi driver with an address that he said did not exist. After consulting with the hotel staff and other drivers, the address remained completely unknown. However, I knew of a local landmark close to where I believed the address was, and I had the driver take me there. I hoped I could find the way the rest of the journey from there. And I was right. Elizabeth Kadetsky is a two-time Fulbright Scholar to India in 1999 and 2019. Elizabeth, you out there? No, Elizabeth? I saw Elizabeth earlier. She, she, had she had to run. I was going to ask her what it's like to go back to the same country 20 years later. Michelle Campos completed her Fulbright in 2000 in Israel. Jessica Van Teen Birkenholtz completed her Fulbright during 2004 through 2006 in Nepal. Robert Rosa has received two Fulbright Awards for scholarship in India, the first in 2005 and the second in 2017. <laughs> Tamir Sarek completed his Fulbright in 2008 in Israel. William Shuey completed his Fulbright Award in Kazakhstan in 2012. <laughs> Stephen Rubin completed his Fulbright in India in 2013. Thank you. 
Our fourth region is Europe and Eurasia. And here's another story related to the living in the moment as a Fulbrighter. Fulbright is about taking advantage of opportunities. On an overnight train ride from Krakow, we didn't realize that the train was split during the night, with one half proceeding to our destination, Bratislava, and the other half going to Prague. As you might guess, we woke up in Prague. Not only were we in the wrong city, we were in the wrong country. But we spent a wonderful day in Prague and finally got to Bratislava 10 hours later. Tanya Furman completed her Fulbright in Iceland in 1982. That's the 40th anniversary on the 75th anniversary. Murray Nelson has completed three Fulbright Awards. The first to Iceland in 1983, the second to Norway in 1990, and the third to Hungary in 2007. Murray is accompanied by his wife, Elizabeth. Welcome, Elizabeth. Robert Elkin completed his Fulbright in Austria during 1992-1993. Laurel Terry is a three-time Fulbright recipient, having completed Fulbrights in Austria in 1992 and in Germany in 1998 and 2005. Susan D'Amico completed her Fulbright in 1993 in Germany. Mandy Mer Amanda Merriman completed her Fulbright in the United Kingdom in 1996. Chris Muscarella completed his Fulbright in 2001 in Portugal. <laughs> Heather McCoon Brun completed her Fulbright in Germany in 2002. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Michelle Gordon completed her first Fulbright in Denmark in 2005 and a second Fulbright in Malta in 2009.
Danielle Hickey completed her Fulbright in 2006 in Russia. Elizabeth Beckett Camerata completed her Fulbright in 2006 in Ukraine. Karen Kiefer Boyd has completed two Fulbrights, the first in Finland in 2006 and the second in Austria in 2012. Sherry Robinson has completed two Fulbrights, the first in Norway in 2008 and the second to Iceland in 2016. <laughs> Randall Newnham completed his Fulbright in Germany in 2009. Catherine Pearson completed her Fulbright in the United Kingdom during 2009-2010. Sandra Harbert Petrolinus completed her first Fulbright in Germany in 2010 and a second Fulbright in Germany in 2023. 2013, 2023. What was the second year? It was supposed to be 2020. 2020. It was supposed to be. Got it, so it's coming. Right. Got it. Congratulations. Marie-Louise Abram completed her Fulbright in Germany in 2011. Mark Agee completed his Fulbright in Greece during 2012-2013. Mark Brennan has received two Fulbright Awards to Ireland, the first in 2012, and the second will begin next month. Russell Frank completed his first Fulbright in 2012 in Ukraine and his second Fulbright in 2019 in Greece. <laughs> 
Shannon Harvey completed her Fulbright in France in 2019. Catherine Weiner completed her Fulbright during 2019-2020 in Ukraine. <laughs> Karen Van Tufam completed her Fulbright in Norway in 2020. Chancellor Jennifer Cushman completed her first Fulbright in 1999 in Belarus, Kyrgyzstan, and the Czech Republic, and her second Fulbright in India in 2013, and a third, yes, a third Fulbright in France in 2017. Massimo Asaf completed her first Fulbright in Germany in 1989 and her second Fulbright in Japan in 2001. Our final region is East Asia and the Pacific. And along with this group comes our final Fulbright story. Fulbright is about expecting the unexpected. On my first night in country, as a pescatarian, I was pleased my host colleague had invited me to a restaurant that served fish. My colleague handled ordering after first having ascertained and made certain that I liked fish. I was surprised then when the main dish turned out to be octopus ten tentacles. <laughs> I was even more surprised when I could see the tentacles were still moving on the plate, <laughs> as if trying to escape. I realized I was not in America anymore. Matthew Kaplan completed his Fulbright in Japan during 1994-1995. Kevin Furlong completed his Fulbright in New Zealand in 2003. <laughs> Ravinda Cole has completed two Fulbright programs, both in Thailand, during 2006 and again in 2013. Rick Bates has also completed two Fulbrights. The first was in Thailand in 2011, and the second in Cambodia in 2019. Melanie Miller Foster completed her first Fulbright in Korea in 2014 and a second Fulbright in Malaysia in 2018. Thanks, 
Daniel Foster complete his first Fulbright in Korea in 2014, and you get no guesses where his second Fulbright was, in Malaysia in 2018. Kristen Millett completed her Fulbright in Australia in 2020. <laughs> Samir Asadi has been selected as a Fulbright specialist for 2022. This is always the danger point, right? Because that's the end of my list, but there's always somebody. Have we missed anybody this evening? Oh, well done, crew. That's good work. All right, thank you. Please join me in recognizing everyone this evening with a round of applause. And please thank me in, in, in thanking our very special guests for greeting each and every Fulbrighter here tonight. Thank you. So we're getting towards the closing, and I want to say a sincere thank you to all of you for taking the time to be here to, with us tonight to celebrate this tremendous impact of the Fulbright program on Penn State, on our nation, and in societies around the world, as Ethan so graciously described earlier. The goals of the Fulbright program are profound. And as I look around this room, I'm struck by this thought People-to-people -people relationships can and do transcend the complexities and pressures of governmental affairs. The Fulbright program reminds us that people-to-people -people diplomacy confirms that there is so much more that unites us than divides us in this world. Each one of you has had a unique individual experience where you made connections that transcended yourselves. The power of one person engaging in meaningful, impactful work in collaboration with others cannot be understated. I'm reminded of the quote by the renowned cultural anthropologist Margaret Mead, who incidentally was born in Philadelphia. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. As I look around this room, I see thoughtful, engaged, committed citizens who have and will continue to change the world. Please give yourselves one more round of applause. I need to thank Dr. Alan Goodman, President and CEO of the Institute for International Education, Deputy Assistant Secretary Ethan Rosenzweig. Thank you to both of you. I need to thank President Eric Barron and Molly Barron, and I need to thank Provost Nick Jones and Judy Graham. I need to thank those discipline-based panel mentors who we recognized earlier. Thank you. We, we can't do this without critical friends. Thank you. And I need to thank our talented team in Penn State Global, led by Mel White and Adrian Eichenlaub and their colleagues, Susan D'Amico, Daly, Haley Dietz, Ryan Geiger, Taryn Herlocker, Colleen Hinoski, Jan Liu, 
Aisha Nabe, Sylvester Asagi, Alexandra Pasico, Nate Rufo, and Jenna Salt. I'm going to, yes, thank you. Thank you to Tom Gallagher from Music Mart and to Chris Walmart for our AV support. Samantha and Catherine, who I think still have a trick to play tonight for their photography. Thank you, Samantha and Catherine. And Erin Reed, our banquet manager and the Penn State Catering Group and their team. Thank you. Thank you to the many of you who provide us pictures that we could display tonight. And of course, uh, thank you to all our Fulbrighters for attending tonight. I'll end my comments with one final thought. After the provost's concluding comments, please remember to stay so our photography team, Samantha and Catherine, can arrange a group photograph. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nicholas P. Jones, Executive Vice President and Provost of the Pennsylvania State University, reporting directly to President Eric J. Barron and soon to President-elect Neely Bendapudi. Provost Jones serves as Penn State's Chief Executive Officer in the President's absence, and he's involved in nearly all university operations. Provost Jones is the university's Chief Academic Officer, and in that role oversees all academic units, including colleges, schools, campuses, and major academic sport units. He came to Penn State in July of 2013 from the Johns Hopkins University where he served as the Benjamin T. Rome Dean of the Whiting School of Engineering, and previously as a professor and chairman of civil engineering. He also served two years as professor and head of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He holds an MS and a PhD in civil engineering from the California Institute of Technology, and previously earned his undergraduate degree in civil engineering from the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Please join me in welcoming Provost Jones. Roger, I've just noticed I brought the wrong folder. Um, do, you, do you mind if I uh, use my remarks for the Shire Honors College Executive Advisory Board? Okay, the, the, ri the ribbing starts now, so just so you know. Well, thank you, uh, Roger, very much, uh, and good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you for what has been a truly special event. Thank you for a wonderful celebratory evening. As the flagship international educational exchange program sponsored by the US government, Fulbright was designed in part to bolster mutual understanding between people from the United States and from other countries. When then US Senator William Fulbright introduced his namesake program in 1946, he believed it would enable people to relate to each other better culturally and that learning more about each other would facilitate peace in the world. Peace. That aspiration is clearly as important today as it was then. In a speech in 1983, Mr. Fulbright said, educational exchange can turn nations in, into people, contributing as no other form of communication can to the humanizing of international relations. The Fulbright program continues to create opportunities for people of different nationalities to know, understand, and learn from each other and to understand themselves and their home countries in previously unimaginable ways. I know this firsthand. As Roger mentioned, I came to the United States from New Zealand in 1980 as a Fulbright Scholar, and the opportunity served as a springboard to help me achieve in a long-time engineering and higher education career. Having served as Penn State's provost for almost nine years, 
I have had ample opportunities to immerse myself in thinking about what it means to be a truly global university. And today, Fulbright is integral to our strategic planning and the vibrancy of our university's academic community. In Penn State's strategic plan through 2025, titled Our Commitment to Impact, enhancing global engagement is one of six foundations. Penn State is a thriving global institution that requires ongoing integration of varied perspectives across the university community and in all components of its land-grant mission. An enhanced focus on global engagement is central to that mission in the 21st century, reinforcing that we must offer students and faculty opportunities to be global citizens, which extends Penn State's impact around the world. Another foundation in the plan is advancing inclusion, equity, and diversity, which is essential to educating and preparing our students for life in a complex, ever-changing, and interconnected society. We foster a culture of respect and inclusion that values the experiences and perspectives of faculty, staff, and students. Both foundations are truly are integral to a truly global Penn State. So it's no surprise that we strongly support the Fulbright program and engagement with it. We strive to achieve the Fulbright vision of a more peaceful world connected through international educational exchange. We recognize how the Fulbright program provides diverse educational and cultural opportunities that faculty and students can leverage for personal, professional, and institutional benefit. A few years ago, to assist our faculty in the Fulbright application process, we created discipline-based peer review panels. These panels consist of former faculty Fulbright recipients who have successfully navigated the application process and received awards. Our six disciplinary panel categories are humanities and social sciences, engineering and all sciences, arts and architecture, business law and education, medicine and health and human development, and communications and information sciences and technology. These panels share insights and knowledge about the application process in hopes of increasing the number of faculty who receive Fulbright awards. Any faculty member across the university can submit their completed drafts to be reviewed by a panelist who, who then will read, will read it and follow up with them. Many of our Fulbright alumni serve as mentors to those who hope to participate in the program. I thank everyone who is engaged in this effort and committed to having a positive impact. It makes a difference. Penn State has been a top producer for Fulbright scholars for 10 consecutive years. We rank number three this year with eight faculty receiving Fulbright awards, and we achieved the number one ranking in 2019-2020 with 13 award winners. We are so proud of our Fulbright scholars and what they contribute to our university and beyond. Ranking so highly among doctoral institutions is an honor for Penn State and it spotlights our exemplary faculty and their commitment to impactful research and teaching. Of course, the Fulbright program is only one of many vital components of our institution's global commitments, supporting and advancing the goal of achieving a more peaceful, interconnected world. Penn State's Global Engagement Network with its pillars of global citizenship for students, faculty, and staff, 
as well as global leadership in scholarship and international activities, provides a strategic focal point and support infrastructure for many unique opportunities. The organically developed and faculty-driven network increases Penn State's global presence and relevance. It also gets us the best return on investment by concentrating our efforts in a few strategic and carefully selected places around the world. This work in includes forging new and impactful partnerships, an area in which Penn State has made great strides during the past several years. We have a central database for international agreements, templates for common collaborations, and articulation agreement guideline and policies. Some of these partnerships had le led to the development of centers that enable Penn State to engage with peer educational and research institutions and then to do collaborative research on issues of common interest. This makes it easier for faculty to identify potential host institutions abroad and the most relevant topics for research and teaching. Our current partners span the globe and going forward, we expect engagements to be thematic in nature, driven by emerging global challenges. Penn State, as you heard, also has strong uh, hum Humphrey Fellowship Program, Education Abroad, and Intensive English Programs. We host thousands of enrolled international students and have many esteemed international faculty some of whom are Fulbright scholars who contribute meaningfully to our community. Penn State's commitment to and engagement with the Fulbright program is unwavering. We value it for myriad reasons, including the opportunities it offers for cultural enrichment and vital research. It has been an honor to celebrate the Fulbright 75th anniversary this evening. Thank you all for being here tonight, and before you depart, please stay, as Roger indicated, for a few minutes for a group photo. Please have a good evening. Thank you for being here, and safe travels home. <laughs>